Hi everyone, I'm Amit Sharma, uh, representing the PyY community. And today I'm very excited to have Yujia Zeng join us, uh, who is the lead developer for Causal Learn, uh, the packages in PyY. And the focus of Causal Learn is on causal discovery, which is one of the hardest problems in causal inference. How do you get causal structure from just data that you might have uh, in your system or in, in the world more broadly? Uh, so Yujia Zeng is a student at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Kun Sang. Uh, so as you might remember, we had a talk from Kun Sang in the previous uh, lecture. I'll add a link to that once the talk is released. Uh, so for those updates, do join Discord. Uh, for the uh, for we have a channel uh, on Discord for PyY where you can get all these updates. Uh, you can also join our Google group, uh, which also announces the talk details if you prefer email. So I'll show share both those details uh, in the chat here. Uh, but today I'm very happy to hand it over to Yujia, who's going to go into more detail, just continuing from the talk uh, from Kun last week, Lime, and he's going to go into more detail. Uh, about the library. Yeah, thanks so much for the great introduction and thanks for everyone to come. So as you may already know that causal learning is kind of like a Python package for cause discovery and also a part of the PyY ecosystem. And so in this very short tutorial, we will briefly introduce causal learn as well as some like related algorithm. So after this talk, we hope that we can get a general picture of which algorithm should I use for which type of data. So yeah, so why causality? Then let's start from a very general definition. So in this article, it's shown that, okay, couples who share the housework are more likely to divorce. So it's kind of ridiculous because it gives an excuse that like that, so, oh, I don't want to wash the dishes because I don't want to divorce with you. So obviously it's not true. So because, but that type of conclusion is, uh, comes from like, uh, spirit correlation instead of causation. So in order to really see whether that is true or whether it's like just a ridiculous like fault, we need to study the underlying causality on the, uh, between like these type of events. So causal discovery, as Emmett just mentioned, is a way to discover causal information based only on the observational data, which means that we don't need any interventional experiments or other type of background knowledge, and we can get the causal structure from scratch, from our observation data. And of course, we need to have some serial guarantee about the correctness of the recent result. And another example is that in that figure, so basically we can see like a positive correlation between chocolate consumption and also the number of Nobel Prizes. So yes, we, we all believe that it's something that we hope it to be true, but unfortunately it's not, right? We cannot get more Nobel Prize if we eat more chocolate. So if we have a like causal discovery measure, we can see that there will be no direct causal relation between chocolate consumption and number of Nobel Prizes. And then we can get rid of the type of like spurious correlation. So yeah, we can just see causal discovery as an estimation problem. So here we assume that our data represent in that, in that maybe data frame is generated uh, according to an underlying ground truth causal graph, like that, like that Y structure. But we cannot observe this underlying ground, uh, ground truth structure, and we will have to recover it based only on the data. So in the linear cases, it's just like a linear structure equation model, and it's non-linear cases, it's like a non-linear version. And so there will also maybe some latent confounder we need to deal with. So the whole problem is just like an estimation problem that we will have to discover everything from only observational data. However, the real-world data needs more general measure because the real-world data is usually much more complicated. For example, in that uh, stock market data, we always have some non-station relationship. For example, here uh, we can see that actually the correlation suddenly change. The correlation between Pfizer and Boeing suddenly change in, during like 2020. And we all know it might be related to the pandemic, right? And yeah, we can actually see this changing mechanism from those stationary data. Like for example, here we can see that the causal mechanism of both Pfizer and Boeing changed during COVID. And also there might exist a correlation or a causal relation between Pfizer and Boeing during COVID because vaccines likely bolster tribal confidence impacting the aerospace sector. So in other words, the real world data is pretty complicated and we need different type of causal discovery algorithm in order to get causal conclusion from data with that kind of theoretical guarantees. 
So motivated by this, we have proposed a causal learn. And basically, causal learn consists of four parts. So the first part is the most important one. Uh, it consists of different type of search measure, like different type of causal discovery algorithm. And we will see later like uh, which does uh, which algorithm should I choose under which type of concept uh, data. And we also have included some like independent modulars, for example, the conditional independent test and also score functions. And lastly, we also have some utility like graphical operation and also some uh, function for the evaluations. So yeah, so the first question for a practitioner to utilize causal learning or causal discovery is which algorithm should I choose? So here is a very rough like roadmaps if all variables are observed and we will not go into details now, but after the talk, we, maybe we will revise this uh, roadmap so we can get a clear sense. And so basically the, uh, the first step is try to get a scatter plot in order to for us to get a little bit of information about the distribution. And then we will decide which algorithm should I choose based on the specific type of function variations and specific type of distributions. And of course, if there are some latent variable, we still have that type of roadmap and we can choose the appropriate uh, algorithm with CLTO guarantees. So yeah, in causal learning, there are a lot of methods and we, as you can see, we basically cover most representative categories of algorithm in the causal discovery task. So, and we also have like various condition independent tests and score functions. So yeah, we'll start from like some very representative and classical algorithm in causal discovery. We'll briefly describe the procedure as well as some uh, as well as some corresponding assumption. And after that, we hope we can get a sense of like which algorithm should I choose based on the specific property of data. So, so a very uh, representative category of algorithm is that constraint-based algorithm. So without confounder, which means that we observe all uh, variables of our interest, we can just use Peter Kark algorithm, that is PC algorithm. But with confounders, that means that we have some variables that we cannot see from our data. We can just use the extended version of PC that is called fast causal inference, FCI, to deal with the problem. So the typical constraint-based causal algorithm it's just trying to see the causal structure from these conditional independent relations. So here we have data, and then we can estimate the co uh, conditional independent structure from this data by just using some uh, tests, for example, the Fisher Z test or the kernel based conditional independent test. And then the constraint based causal discovery algorithm just infers the causal structure from these conditional independent relations. And for example, the PC algorithm, uh, they just they just observe like data from this causal graph, but obviously we don't know, we don't, we cannot observe this causal graph. So we have these conditional independent relations, and the PC algorithm starts from a complete skeleton, and then the first step is that they try to find a skeleton based on the this CI test, and for example, begin with this uh, complete direct, complete skeleton, because of x1 is independent of x2, we can remove x1 and x2 these edges. And then we can remove that x1 and x4 based on this condition independent relations. And then we can remove x2 and x4 based on this relationship. So after that, we get a skeleton of the underlying ground truth. And then we need to do some orientation to make the undirected edge directed. And in order to, to do that, the key step is to try to find weak structures and doing oriented propagation. For example, here, because we have x1 independent of x2, so there must be a V structure here, and then we can do the uh, uh, the following orientation like that. So this is a PC algorithm, although it might seem complicated. The general intuition is exactly what I just described, so it's pretty easy. So the for the first step is like A and B, and for the for the step of finding the V structure is the step C, and for D it's just some orientation rule. So we can orient all edges as many edges as possible based on the discovered V structures. And the principle of that orientation step is that we always try to avoid spurious V structure and we try to get away from cycles because at this point, we always assume that the underlying ground truth causal deck is a deck. So there will, won't be any cycles in the ground truth. However, the output of the PC algorithm or like all the constraint based algorithm is not a direct cyclic graph. It's actually a CP deck, which means that it only consists of uh, Markov equivalent classes. 
So according to a definition, two decks are independent equivalent if and only if they have the same skeleton and the same restructure. So we can see that actually for some kind of edges, the directions are not unique. So how can we represent the output, right? So in a CP deck, we have these three types of portable edges. X1 and X2 are completely disconnected, which means that, okay, they are not adjacent in any member in that equivalent class. And another type of edge is that, okay, there exists an undirect edge between the two nodes. So which means that, okay, the direction might be reversed in some members and might be like this in some members. And of course, there exists another type of edge that, okay, we just have X1 pointing to X2. And that means that there uh, will be a causal effect from X1 to X2 in every member of the equivalent class. So for example, in this CP deck, there exists actually like two decks because we can have like two direction for the edges between X1 and X2. And another example is that just like that from, uh, from a complete undirect graph, we can remove edges according to the conditional independent relations to get uh, like the like a correct select uh, skeleton, and then we find the V structure based on the condition independence relation. And then we can do the kind of constraint based search like that. So yeah, in that example, we can see the uh, the relations between these type of variables, which has been verified in this paper. And also in the archaeology data, we can see that actually in real world, the relationship between variables are pretty general, like nonlinear, right? So, however, for constraint-based method, if we choose the correct type of or the appropriate type of condition independent test, we can do with different type of data. For example, the kernel-based condition independent test is very general, so it can do with some nonlinear or non-parametric type of data. So in that case, we just use PC with kernel-based condition independent test, and we can see the structure like that. However, as we just mentioned, the output of the uh, PC algorithm or other constraint-based algorithm is not a uh, DAG. So there may exist some edges, for example, a uh, climate and diet, the edges between them, that remain undirected. However, with a little bit of background knowledge, for example, if we know that there will be an edge from 6 pointing to 7, we can orient some other edges according to mixed rules. For example, if we already know six pointing to seven, we can orient like seven pointing to three and three pointing to five and also three pointing to four. So in conclusion, with a little bit of background knowledge, we can orient a lot of uh, edges and our result will benefit from it a lot. So yeah, PC of course is included in causal learn and we can see that it's actually very easy to apply PC in causal learn. We just write first import PC and then we input our data into the PC function. So data here is just nothing but a, like a numpy array, so it's pretty standard. And then we get our causal graph, CG, and we have our like one line function, draw a pi dot graph to visualize the output, or we can just save the graph utilizing like whatever method you prefer. So yeah, as we have mentioned that actually the key point or the key component of the constraint-based algorithm is the independent test method. If we choose the correct type of conditional independent test, we can deal with arbitrary type of data, right? For example, for linear Gaussian data, we can just use features D. For discrete type of data, we can use chi-square or g-square. And for rather general non-parametric distribution, we can just use kernel-based conditional independent test. And even if we deal with some practical issues, for example, if we have like missingness, we can use MV features D, which called missing, missing value features Z, which I will elaborate a little bit uh, in detail further. And yeah, let's see another example. So here we have a data set like called auto MPG. So as you can see from this figure, it's just like a pretty standard data frame, nothing special. And we have, we all will have this type of data somewhere, like maybe we are of, of our interest. So for that data, as we just mentioned, we can just uh, put the data into that function. And also we keep our labels as, our, as we want. And then we can get our causal graph and we have a way to visualize it, right? And also we can input our labels into the visualization. So we get a result like that. It's pretty straightforward and it's really fast. So yeah, we have already seen that how to do the constraint based call discovery when we observe all variable. How about the confounders, right? For example, if we, if we have all these like 
conditional independent relations in the distribution, is it possible to have confounders behind X3 and X4? Obviously, it's not, right? Because if we have a confounder here, there won't be the conditional independent that X1 that is conditional independent of X4 given X3, because in that path, X1 to X3 to C to 4, the X3 will be a collider. So if we condition on that, that path will be deconnected, which means that we will have the conditional dependence between X1 and X4. So yes, there is, it's, it's impossible for us to have a confounder here, given only these like, conditional independent relations. And in another example, if all the conditional independent relationship are these three type of like, conditional independence, are there confounder behind X2 and X4? Obviously, it's, there must be a confounder between them, right? As, because otherwise, there will be a independent relation between X2 and X4. So yeah, we can see that in some cases, we can decide whether there exists a confounder, latent confounder, given only the observational data. So yeah, so the first example might be like the rating web one and slippery. Of course, there won't be any confounder between web one and slippery. And for the second example, there will be some confounder between I am in this lecture room and you are in this, this lecture room. That, that confounder might just be, okay, we are, but we are classmates, something like that. So yeah, and in addition, there are some real world examples that I know there is no confounder. So I will skip detail, but the conclusion is that the PC algorithm found that among the measure variables, the only direct cause of biomass was pH. So in what we have seen that in some real world cases, we can see that, okay, there exists no confounders based only on observational data. And similarly, there are some cases that there must be some confounders. For example, in the cases that like I'm not sick, so I'm not in. I'm in the class, and you are not sick, and you are in the class. And the confounder is that we are we are lab mates. And also in the chocolate and the leading in sciences, the confounder might be the economic status of some countries instead of direct causal effect from chocolate to Nobel Prize. So, yeah, based on that kind of intuition, we have an extended version of the PC called FCI, trying to infer the some latent variable and also the structure between latent variable and observed variable given only the observation data. However, as you may imagine that in the presence of latent variables, the causal process over measured variables is not necessarily the deck. So how can we represent equivalent class over this observed variable? Because in our result, we cannot really include these latent variables. So how, so what type of the output will FCI have? So as you, uh, so as you may remember, for the output of PC, it's not a DAX, it's just like a CP DAX, which represents the Markov equivalent classes. So we have these three types of possible edges. However, in the cases with latent variables, there are more types of edges. So for the output, we call it a pack, which means partially ancestral graphs. So here, of course, we have like the disconnected edges, which means that they are not adjacent. And also, we may have some edges that there exists a circle on the X1 side, and also there exists an arrowhead on the X2 side. So that only means that X2 is not an ancestor of X1. However, if you have like circles on both sides, that means that there exists no set that separates X2 and XY. And if we have only have the like arrowhead on X2, but a tail on X1, that means that, okay, X1 is a cause of X2, very straightforward and something we would like to see. However, if there exists an arrowhead on both half of the on both endpoints, that means that there must be a latent common cause of X1 and X2. So we can try to include a latent confounder here if we see that type of double-headed arrow. So yeah, in fact, we can try to represent the, the function, the causal relations among observed variables, even if we do, even when we do not directly observe some variable latent confounders. So of course, FCI is also included in causal learn, and the usage example is pretty similar. We just input FCI and we put our data into that function and then everything is good. So yeah, so this is the output of the FCI function in causal learn. It's basically a deck, which we, we have already seen. And we denote a uh, different type of the endpoint by different values in kind of like adjacency metric. So yeah, we have seen constraint-based method and very general is pretty flexible depending on what type of functional uh, like the conditional independent test you would like to choose. And another type of like category, recurrent category of the method is based on 
score is based on like some Bayesian score, which is called score based call discovery. So for constraint based method, basically uh, they try to infer the call structure based on conditional independent relations. But for score based method, it's, the procedure is more like a model selection, right? So for the for each candidate graph, like candidate model, we will have a score corresponding to it. And we always choose the candidate structure with the highest score. So the score might just be some Bayesian score like BIC or OEIC, et cetera. And why is the score based uh, search is possible? So for here, we assume that we have a true structure, true, true structure like that. However, if we have like a like a actual edges, for example, E pointing to A, it will only increase the number of parameters we fit in, which means that the model will be more complicated. And if we have that some kind of penalty on the complexity of the model in our chosen score, the score will not be optimal. So in that case, our, our procedure will not prefer that type of like unnecessary redundance, like adding an unnecessary edge. And on the other hand, if we have an edge missing in our, in our solutions, it cannot be compensated by accurate fitting of parameters, which means that if we have like a part of our score that is based on the likelihood, the likelihood will not be optimal and score will not be optimal, which means that our model will not be that one because the procedure will not select that suboptimal like candidate. So yeah, as you may mentioned, there are some key issues for score-based call discovery. The first is that what score to use. So if we choose the correct score, we can have like the correct result. And if you choose some general score, we can deal with some general distribution, just like that in the conditional independence relationships and the constraint based search. And another issue is that how to traverse the third space of the graph. Do we want to traverse between DAX or do we want to traverse between equivalent classes and how to do the optimization? So yeah, I said news that as we may already know that given uncomplete data set and no hidden variables, Locating the Bayesian network structure, like in a, using an exhaustive search, is a MP hard problem. So greedy search is often used in practice. However, a good news is that according to the some result, like the GES result, some algorithm guarantee locating the generating model in the large sample limit, even in a greedy manner. So based on that, we can have the ability to approximate in the generating network even though the exact research is NP hard. Yeah, we just do it in a greedy way. And that's why we have GES called the G greedy equivalent search algorithms. So for GES, for the greedy search to be true, we must have some assumption. And the key assumptions are about the scores. So the score is required to be score equivalent, which means that for different decks, different members in the equivalent class, they should have the same score. And also the score have to be locally consistent, which means that score of a deck increases by adding an edge that element of false independent constraint. So only if the score is local con locally consistent, we can guarantee that, okay, we get the correct result when we try to choose some model with the optimal score. And of course, for the greedy search to be possible, we need our score to be decomposable, which means that we can always decompose the, local, the global score into the sum of some local score. And an example of the score satisfying all these property is just Bayesian information criteria, like that. So we have the likelihood part, and also we have the uh, complexity penalty part. So M here is just the number of the uh, parameter in models. So the GS search procedure is kind of straightforward. So basically, it covers two, two stages. The first stage is about the forward greedy search. So we start from usually an empty graph, and then in each iteration, we add one edge with uh, with like the edge that will increase the score more. And then we do the iteration again and again until we reach to a local maximum. And after that, we go to our second stage. It is called backward greedy search. So we start from the output of the forward search. And then at that time, we remove one edge during one iteration and during during that removing operation, we always prefer to remove some edges that increases the score most. And then, then we do it again and again until we, reach, until we reach a local maximum. So that will be our like, final report. And according to GS, the result is always correct if we do that like, correctly and other assumptions are satisfied. So we can just imagine the 
procedure based on that example. We have empty grub and then we add edges. And also similar, we can imagine the procedure based on that ground truth. So in Kotal Learn, again, GES is also very simple. We just input our data into the GES and then we can visualize everything. And in the previous example of the auto MPG data set, the, as you may imagine, the, as you may remember, the very typical data frame, the GES is also pretty simple. Like we just input our data and we can visualize everything like that. So this is a result of the GES. And as you may already observe that there may exist some edges that stays undirected. And that is because even for score-based causal discovery algorithm, the output is still like a macro equivalent classes, not the deck. So there will be some like uh, ambiguity remains for some edges. So yeah, we have seen constraint-based measure and also score-based measure. However, for real-world applications, there will be some practical issues. For example, we may have missing data and we may have some non-stationary or even heterogeneous data. So the missing data is really common, right? If we are doing trying to deal with some like uh, data frame, we may have seen some uh, like NAN or just empty entry in that, in that data frame. So how should we deal with that? It's because like conditional independent relationships in the data are very sensitive to the missingness. So the key issue here is that we try to recover these conditional independent relations in the original population, given only this incomplete observation data without any experiments. So here we need to introduce some notation. So we try to introduce the missingness indicator SR represents the status of missingness. And if Rx is one, the corresponding value of X is missing, which means there will be some like uh, entry missing or sample missing the value of X, for example, X2 here. And if it is zero, it is fully observed. And by in introducing that type of like missingness indicator, we have a missingness graph. So according to Rubin, all missing data maximum fall into one of the following categories. The first category, missing complete at random, means that the cost of missingness is purely random. So it's just like figure A, figure 1A, which means that, okay, the, the cost of the missingness, the cost of the missingness indicator is not, has been, is not observed or is not included in the graph. So it's completely random. And the second type is missing at random, which means that, okay, we observe the cost of the missingness, but the cost of the missingness is fully observed. So it's missing at random. And the third type is just like not neither MAR nor MCR. There is a missing not at random, which means that like figure one C, like just like figure one C, we observe the cost of the missingness W here. However, W is a gray node, which means that it's not fully observed. So it's called missing not at random. And with this assumption, like pretty thin assumption in the literature, we have our algorithm called missing value PC that can deal with the missingness data. The procedure is very simple. We just add our missing variable R to data set, and we create noise that R do not cause any observed variables. And then we run a PC adjacent search over V and R, and then we can identify some adjacent over these over these like variables, and we remove some like spurious one, and then we do the orientation according to the micro to get the result in the presence of missing values. So. Yeah, again, MVPC, missing value PC, is also included in causal learn. And actually, it's based on PC, and it's very easy to really deal with missing values in causal learn because the only thing we need to do is just to change the value of that hyperparameter, MVPC, into true. So by default, it's false. But if we believe that all the data has some missing values, we can just uh, change it into true, and everything will be fine. At the same time, we need to change the independent test to MV features D, which is a special one we designed for the missing values. However, for some other type of data, we may easily have some non-stationary relationship. For example, for time series data and like for some video, like we always have like time step as the time index. So we always have like change of distribution. Also for some multi-domain data, if we want to do some transfer learning, we always have now ID data. So it will add some information for us to discover the code structure, but it will also add some complexity you know, for, you know, for us to get the correct result. So yes, the causal modeling and distribution shift heavily coupled. However, there is something that stays invariant, that is the independent change, right? The distribution of cost and conditional distribution of effect given cost 
always change independent p across the shape of distributions. So yeah, the causal mechanism will change. And there are basically like three questions to answer. Is there any measure to determine the changing causal modules and change and estimating the scatter in the present of like change of distribution? And how can we orient the causal directions uh, benefiting from the independent changes? And how do the non-stationary modules change over time in the cross data set? So we have answered all these questions in our algorithm called CD node. So to identify the variables with changing causal modules and recover cause scattering, we can just incorporate time or domain index C as a surrogate variable. For example, for a video, we always have like time step. And that time step can just be seen as a time index C. And we included a surrogate variable, for example, GC here. And then we just apply a constraint based called discovery algorithm in order for us to get the skeleton. And for those variables that connected with the, that surrogate variable, we believe that their, their causal mechanism might be changed during the shape of distributions. And then to identify the causal direction by using distribution shift, we just due to the fact that also, although the, although the distribution change, there will always be the independent change in P cost and the P effect given cost. However, it is not the case if we switch the position of cause and effect, right? Because there won't be any independent changes if between P effect and P cost given effect. And based on that principle, we can easily distinguish cause from effect even in the present of distribution shift. And then we can use some kernel non-stationary visualization to visualize the change in causal modules. So yeah, CD node is also included in causal land and as uh, it's also in the similar fashion. We input data, and if we, we want to do a more advanced version, or if we want to study some like some kind of specific data, we can always customize param parameters, and we include a lot in this constraint-based method, and then we can just draw the graph based on that. So yeah, actually that example we have seen before is generated by the CD node, because right now we have the date, the date index as the, as the surrogate variables. So from this result, we can see right the causal mechanism of Boeing and Pfizer changed during the during the pandemic, and also we may see the correlation between them, which is also very sensitive to the to the time time factor, right? Because only during pandemic we can see this type of uh, like the vaccine influencing the travel's confidence. So yeah, so at that point we have seen a constraint based method and all, as well as score based method. However, for all these methods, even with the presence of some background knowledge, we cannot determine the direction for all edges because the output of these measures are just CP DAX and they are just macro equivalent classes. And for each equivalent classes, it consists of a lot of DAX. So how can we go from the macro equivalent classes to the DAX? And we need to dis so we need to distinguish some cause from effect. And yeah, we will discuss the linear non Gaussian second model, additive noise model, and as well as the post nonlinear model for which this model uh, proved to be identifiable that we can return the DAX, which means that we can always distinguish cause from effect for this method. So here we have the causal process, like ring causing wet ground. And an, a very basic principle in this structural causal model is that we always have independent noises, which means that the acknowledged noise of that causal mechanism is always independent of the cost x. So that's called independent noise. And our way to encode the intuition is that the py given x is always independent of px. However, without any constraint on f, one can find independent noise for both directions, which means that if even if we cannot distinguish cause from effect, there will still be that kind of independent noise, which means that we cannot really test the test the bivariate cause a bivariate causal relation based only on independent noise if we do not have any constraint on f. So yeah, we need to find some structural constraint on f to get some asymmetry, which means that if we reverse the cause and effect, we cannot get the independent noise so that we can distinguish cause from effect. And there are some type of cause, uh, functional causal model with that type of guarantee. For example, the linear non-Gaussian second model, we have the asymmetry, and also we have we have that for the additive noise model as well as the post nonlinear causal model. So the linear non Gaussian uh, SAK causal model is just like a linear structure equation model with some non Gaussian exogenous noise. So non Gaussian EI non Gaussian. 
and the disturbers yeah non gaussian and are mutually independent for example like here we have a linear system with some non gaussian noises and so the lingam has been proved to be identifiable and as well as its estimation procedure has been verified to be very effective in a lot of real world set and there are some other estimation methods for lingam for example like direct lingam and isolate with sparse connection and so this is an example of how we can how we can apply the lingam on some real world asset. So as you can see from that graph, with the help of lingam, we can determine all the direction the direction of all edges. So the output is, is just straightforwardly a DAG, but not a Markov equivalent car. And of course, there are some other type of lingam. For example, the direct lingam is a regression-based lingam for linear non-Gaussian data, and also ve vector autoregression lingam. So we can use that to do with time series and also RCD for hidden confirmed it, and also CMUV for nonlinear additive noise. So all these methods are developed by Shohei Shimizu's group. And because we have Shohei Shimizu group in our causal length group, so we have the official implementation for all lingam based methods. And interesting is actually the fact for most of our algorithms, because we have Peter Spiritis, we have some Clark Gamer, we have some, we have Quin Zhang, we have some, uh, some other authors. So most algorithm in the causal discovery in causal learn, we have their official implementation, which means that we can always update update it up to date. And if we can if we have any question, we can easily get it done by just asking these others. So yes, the lingam in causal learn is also very straightforward. We just input our data here and we can get the causal order and also the adjacent metrics. And yeah, in the auto MP a uh, quick question yeah. regarding the lingam. <clears throat> um, there's also a lingam package developed by the research group from uh, Shohai, right? Um, what, yeah. what is, uh, the, is there any difference or uh, do you use that package uh, internally or how, how is the difference there? A bit of case, there's no difference. So uh, so the Shohai team direct actually just like, copied the code from their package into the causal lens and the different uh, might be some like API, but uh, the basic code is basically the same. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. So yeah, this is an example from the auto MPG dataset, and we can see that we can determine the direction for all edges, and yeah, just using the lingam in causal learning. And of course, yeah, it is a independent package called lingam, and it includes. It includes like more type of the lingam based method, and if you are interested, you can just directly use that packet, and it's a very very good packet, and also it works well in a lot of data sets. So yeah, we have seen the linear non Gaussian cases, but how about the non linear case, right? Because word is not exactly linear, so we need to add some non linearity in order for us to deal with more distributions. So yeah, again, the hidden principle of trying to distinguish cause from effect in the general distribution is always try to find that asymmetry, right? If we reverse the direction, we cannot get the independent noise condition, so we can distinguish cause from effect. And we can see that kind of asymmetry in the additive noise case, right? Just like that, if we reverse it, we cannot see something like that. And yeah, for additive noise model, it's also included in causal learn, and we can just uh, use that function like causal effect in order to distinguish cause from effect in the binary case. So, however, if we had to take a step further, like even try to generalize the additive noise model, and the, there still exists some some like some functional constraint. So, for example, if we want to consider like three effects encountered in a causal model, and for example, the first one is that we want to consider some nonlinear effect of the cause, and of course we or we try to like make our model more robust to noise, so we should consider the noise effect. And also the measurement might not be very accurate, so we also want to include some sensor or measurement distortion. What functional constraint should we have, right? So fortunately, it has been shown that it can all be represented by a post nonlinear causal model with inner additive noise. So that is called PNL, post nonlinear causal model. So here we just have FI1 is the Nonlinear function of this of the parent of xi, basically the causes of xi. And also, of course, we have some like exogenous noise here to uh, to include the consideration of some noise effect. And also here we have some 
uh, consideration for the distortion, nonlinear distortion, like Fi2. So Fi2 is just like point-wise nonlinear function, and we can just treat it as a measurement error. So yeah, P and L causal model or the, is kind of very general measure because it covers some previous measures as a, as, as a special cases. For example, the linear models, nonlinear additive noise model, and also even the multiplicative noise models. So PNL has been shown to be identifiable, and actually there are very few non-identifiable cases in the PNL structure. So in conclusion, causal direction is generally identifiable if the data were generated according to the post nonlinear form, like x2 equal to f2, f1, xi, 1 plus the noise. And yeah, the PNL model is actually included by causal lens. So as you may see from here, Actually, in causal learning, the PNL only focus on, as well as the AIM, only focus on the bivariate case. And however, this is actually uh, already very helpful because, as we may remember, that for constraint based measure and also for score based measure, they can only recover a uh, Markov equivalent classes, although it's very general, right? So, if we have like a very general nonlinear data, we can just use constraint based measure or or score based measure with some appropriate uh, conditional element test or the score function in order for to get a Markov equivalent class, a CP deck first. And then, based on that CP deck, for these undirected edges, we can then use that, uh, the post nonlinear model like, to directly distinguish cause from effect. And then we can get the orientation information for these undirected edges. And then, after that, we get a complete deck, right? We get the directional information for all edges and the world is beautiful again, right? Because the post nonlinear model is very general, the constraint based model, the GS score based model, models are all very general. So if we do that in that type of pipeline, we can deal with most cases in a pretty straightforward manner. Of course, with theoretical guarantees. So yeah, right now we have actually gone through like very quickly, like most representative algorithm in code discovery. So right now we have like, we are more confident about the, what algorithm should I choose on the which type of data? And let's take a look at that roadmap again. So if all variables are, are, are preserved, first we do a scatter plot in order to get a sense of the distribution. If we observe that, okay, actually we have some discrete data, we can just, just use PC, a constraint based measure with a chi-square test, with a, which is a conditional independent test designed for the discrete data, or we can just, just use some score based measure like GS or GRASP with BDEU uh, score function, that is, score function designed for discrete data. However, if we find that it's continuous, we also have different methods for different solutions for different uh, type of distribution. For example, if we believe that there might be some linear relationship between variables and all exogenous noise are Gaussian, we can just use PC with F feature Z, where we just replace chi square to a feature Z test. Or we can just use score based function, a score based uh, algorithm with the BIC score. However, if we observe some non Gaussian noises, we can always switch it to some Lingam based method, right? And if we observe some post nonlinear relationship, we can just use post nonlinear model, PNL. And if we observe some additive noise model, we can just use NLM. And if we have like a very general non parametric distribution, we can always use constraint based method with a kernel based condition independent test or score-based algorithm with a generalized score. So the general score here is just like a kernel-based score we designed for the score-based algorithm. And just like KCI, it's very general. It can deal with some non parametric type of data. However, even if we have some latent variable, we can do a similar thing, right? We do a scatter plot first, and if it's discrete, we just use FCI plus chi-square. So right here, uh, compared to the observed cases, we just replace PC with its extended version for latent variable that is called FCI, and then everything will be fine. And similarly for linear Gaussian cases, we just replace the test to feature Z. And then for the non linear non-Gaussian cases, we can use the uh, general independent noise, or we can use uh, uh, like latent variables version of Lingam that is called RCD from Shohei Mizu's team. And for additive noise, we have CAMUV, and also for non-parametric cases, we have just have FCI with KCI because FCI is also a constraint based measure. So it can be very general if we choose a general like kernel based condition in the test. So in a word, 
as you may think, there is always a measure for your case, because in causal learn, we cover most official implementation of most representative categories that can deal with most type of data. And in addition, we have different type of conditional independent tests as well as score function. So we can always try to like design a solution or try to combine type of like solution in order to get the measure we want with zero guarantee on the different type of data. And most important, it's very easy to use. So literally we can just apply code discovery in three number code. So first line, we pip install call to learn, and then we just input our data into our function where well, the data is just a numpy array, and then we can do the visualization in a one line function. So yes, so in our documentation, we have more running examples as well as some benching, benchmarking data set for both synthetic and real world data. And also if you are interested in more detail about this algorithm, uh, we have included all references and as well as some instructor instruction and also the structure of the call to learn into our paper as well as the documentation and the GitHub. And if you are interested like in other tests of the causal analysis, uh, you can go check the PyY GitHub organization and there will be an other package like the EcoML and also like DoY. And also there might be some example notebook about how to build a complete pipeline starting from call discovery and then the causal inference and estimations. So yeah, so that's basically the very short tutorial. And I hope uh, at this point we can be more confident about which algorithm should I choose uh, if we are doing like different type of data. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Yujia. Uh, we are open for questions now. Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, hey. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for your for your talk. Um, just a quick question in your overview where you show the <clears throat> different algorithms and so on. Um, you didn't add like what what the output is, right? So like for instance, the NM only directs um, the edges, but it doesn't produce a DAG, right? Um, on the other hand, Lingam can do both. It can produce a DAG and, and the directions. Um, do you, so that, that I think there's a result that like these bivariate approaches can also discover decks if I'm not mistaken from from uh, Peter's you asked Peter's um, do, do you also support something like this for instance to discover the whole deck using bivariate um, discovery methods yes I, I think that's a good question so actually in code learn we for the basic usage we only put the bivariate cases that we try to distinguish code from effect uh, I think we have some example of how to do the multivariate cases. It's just like do it in a pair with minor, but it's pretty straightforward. But we didn't directly include it into the causal length package because like uh, at the beginning, we thought that the use cases of this functional causal based method is that, okay, we first get like maybe a CP deck and that for some specific edges, we try to get the direction of them. So we can directly use a bivariate estimation function and then it might be more flexible. And but I think you're completely right. If someone would like to just use this, for example, A and M to get the whole deck, we should have like a function to do the multivariate case like automatically. And yeah, we have some example, but we haven't included in the package. But I don't think it will be anything like very difficult, and we can do it maybe in a pretty straightforward way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, okay. If you have already examples, then maybe <laughs> that's that's enough. Then cool. Um. Yeah. And maybe quick quick second question. Um. So uh, currently you don't support time series uh, discovery, right? Um, Cause it's covering time series data. So this is all IID based or yeah, with some different environments maybe. Is this right? Uh, yeah, we have we have actually have several measures to deal with uh, time series data. For example, in constraint based method, we have a method called CD naught. Actually try to deal with the heterogeneous distribution. For example, if we try if we have a time index, we can just use it as a federal based variable. And then with CD node, we can get the, uh, get the structure uh, even in the present of distribution shape like time series data. And also for, for Lingam based method, we have a method called a VAR Lingam that is based on vector auto regression. And that method can deal with the uh, time series data in the linear non Gaussian cases. But I agree with you that in the general cases, we don't have a method that is very reliable. So of course, you can use CD node with some like KCI test, but you can only get a macro equivalent classes, but not the whole deck. So yeah, we don't have any 
method in the general case uh, to deal with the uh, time series data, but we do have some algorithm for like maybe linear non Gaussian or even if you are uh, just for, just interested in a macro equation card instead of a deck. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good questions. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, I have a question, Yujia. Uh, so you mentioned there are multiple methods available to use. Uh, is there some way we could uh, suggest methods to users, like if they give you your their data set? Uh, are there ways that Causal Learn can help people think about which method is the best? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So actually, for now we. We can only provide something like that, like the, a roadmap, like you do a scatter plot, and so based on the distributional information, then you can choose the appropriate uh, algorithm. But I believe it will be very helpful if you can, if we can have some automated function, like we rely on some metrics, and then we can automatically determine the type of distribution, and then we can automatically suggest the algorithm. So I believe that will be very practical and also very interesting. But currently, we don't have that kind of algorithm. I think one essential point is that whether we can really get the reliable procedure in order to really distinguish like type of distribution like that. So right now we can just eyeballing the distribution and try to see the okay what the scatter plot is, right? If we have like a reliable procedure to do something like that in an automatic manner, I think we can have that function, just like a suggestion. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. Got it. Yeah, I believe there might be some tests for linearity or non Gaussian noise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, hey, I have a follow up question here. So, so it seems like here you draw the scatter plot, but there, there are so many cases, right? Maybe there are some discrete variable and there are some other continuous variable. And then it's it's not easy to to based on the, the, the framework you suggest here, right? What, what should we do in that case? Yeah, so um, so yeah, if we so right now uh, I just shown the scatter plot, but we also have uh, of course we, we have like a lot of other visualization or other function in order for us to determine the type of distribution. If we believe that the data is actually like discrete, we have uh, some measure to deal with it case, for example, FCI with chi square or like PC or GS with appropriate like test function or score function. But I Believe that one thing is that okay, we need to make sure that the, the data is discrete. So I don't know how to be completely sure if we do not know the ground truth, but if we can have that information as a background noise, okay, we know that it's discrete or continuous, we can have some corresponding algorithm. However, even for some continuous method, uh, we can try to do it in a discrete way because we can always do a discretization, also, it might do some information. So yeah, so there are some some strategies that we can try to apply for general data without without knowing the ground truth, but there are some like trade off like we may do some information or we might not be completely sure about. When when, well, when you say data when you say data is discrete, like do you mean the relationship between the outcome and the treatment, or, or what? Uh, it's scatter scatter plot between what which variable because there there's so many controllers, oh, right? Oh, I see. So discrete here, I mean just like a. Uh, for example, we have like uh, three variables, and for both for all of these variables, they are bivariate, and we try to get the causal graph between these three variables. So it's not necessarily can be inferred by scatter plot, maybe by some other uh, other information, but for discrete, we just mean discrete variables. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? If not, uh, then I would just like to thank Yujia again. Uh, thank you so much, Yujia. I mean, we've seen the causal learn package, but it was very good to get an overview of multiple methods, some of which even I didn't know existed in causal learn. Uh, so that's great to see. And I would encourage everyone to try the package out. Uh, and if you face any issues, maybe post them on GitHub, or you can also contact Yujia directly. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye bye.